Sunday. I'm glad to be here. Let's do that one more time. Happy Sunday! Happy Sunday. Yeah, that's the spirit. I'm glad to be here. Um, it's been a, a while to have a lot of people in the church on Sunday. It's, it's great to worship together, and I'm glad to see you and then, uh, to be able to worship together and to share the Word of God with you all. So, December. There's an announcement first, or? Okay. Okay. Uh, December, right, it's a season of giving. You know, my wife actually stayed late yesterday until midnight to wrap gifts uh, for friends, for family. And, you know, it's something that I don't realize. You know, when I'm still single without kids, without family, Christmas is the time where I receive gifts. When I have kids and I have wife and I have family, it is the season of giving, and that means my wallet are growing, getting thin. You know, give gifts to other people, to other kids, to, the, uh, to, my, to Carl's friends, and to other families. But uh, I guess it is something, something good. You know, I, I'm glad to, to know a lot of you here, and I'm glad to, to share uh, my life uh, and my story with you all. And imagine, right, in the seasons of giving, you know, some of you, again, might receive gifts from your good friends or from your family members. You, if you, you excitedly, you know, get this gift from your friends, right? And you open it. You open it. Oh, it looks square. And maybe it's a book. And you open it, and you see it, and it's a book. And it's titled, Anger Management, Guide to Managing Your Emotions. Man, that's tough, Right? Or imagine you're a girl, right? You carefully open that beautiful bow, and then you open it, and you see overcoming obesity, you know, how to lose your fats. Oh, you know, to, to truly accept that gifts from a friend, right, will require you to swallow your pride. I'm sure will, you, you'll, you'll give this awkward smile, I'm like, Thank you. <laughs> well, in the, in the meantime, you know, your confidence was shaken. Am I that fat? Am I have anger management issue? So what I'm trying to say is, you know, gifts are great. But some gifts, by their very natures, can be challenging to accept. You know, some gifts will require us to swallow our prides. And today I want to share with you that to truly embrace, to accept this gift of Christmas is actually to swallow our pride and to truly embrace the gift of Christmas. It's going to be hard for many of us. Now, please follow along uh, and you'll, you'll know later. But just remember, you know, the gift of Christmas, you know, we, we can sing it loudly. It's a joy to the world. It's happy. But when you truly understand what Christmas means, it will require you to swallow your prides. Now, we are in this series, right, uh, called Worship Jesus. Um, and I still remember uh, the first sermon, you know, Pastor Sugi started this series, and he talked about how we as humans are by nature creator of worship. We are creature of worship. And so I, it really stuck with me, and I, so I studied a bit more. Right? And I want to read from you uh, this uh, short verses from Exodus 20. And it says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods beside me. You shall have no other gods besides me. So Exodus 20 is the place where God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses. You know, that's... Um, and this verses that I share with you is just at the very top before God start, you know, uh, reading through all the commandments. And it's interesting, you know, as I, I study that words, it say, God says, you shall have no other gods besides me. So the choice is not between worshiping God or have this God versus no gods or not worshiping anything. Right? The choice is whether you worship gods or you'll worship other gods. Now, similar thing is said by, by this writer. Uh, his name is David Foster Wallace. He's not a Christian. Some say he's atheist. Some other people say he, he is spiritual. 
um, he he was uh, quite a powerful writer. He he won a lot of awards, and he made one of the um, you know greatest or most popular commencement speech. So if you are interested, you just you know take a picture of that name and then put uh, commencement speech David Foster Wallace 2005. I will read later, but in 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 that commencements, he start with saying everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. Everybody worship. The only choice we get is what to worship. Again, this is not spoken by a Christian. He's either, you know, atheist or some spiritual, you know, believing in something. Um, and we'll, we'll, I'll share a bit more about himself later on. But it's just something, you know, I, I really want you to think because we, we often put people in two different buckets, right? Like, oh, you're, there's this a group of people who worship God, and there's this group of other people who doesn't believe in God or what else, and somewhere in between, right? But the, the, the reality is, regardless of their positions, they worship something. And if it's not God, the true God, then it's something else. And... You know, if you learn or read through history or even from the Bible, right, you will see a history stories of people, including the people of God, you know, the Israel people, who worship a lot of things other than God himself. And perhaps some of you are familiar might remember, I you know, this worship of the golden calf, right? That's one of the popular ones in the Old Testament. But so I guess this, this happens when they, God just brought them out, out of Egypt and then... Um, Moses, uh, you know, who's the leader, he went away. Uh, this is when, you know, when Moses is about to receive the Ten Commandments. So they left Israel and the people think, oh, Moses is gone now. Now who's going to protect us? So they're coming up with this golden calf, right? This is, which is um, one among the gods in Egypt uh, who represents strength. But anyway, you know, this is just one example of many. But if you read through the Bible that the people of Israel, or even people of other nations, worship many things. Uh, some worship like Baal, Baal, some worship Pilsbub, and again, some worship trees, animals, and whatnot. Right? And even Jesus himself, um, in, in the, when he speak with his follower again and again, remind them about worshiping God versus worshiping money. Right? If you remember in the New Testament, there's many, many verses about Jesus reminding his followers that, hey, be careful about the greed of money. So my point here is that when you, root, when you read through history, when you look at history, you know, it, it, it really shows you that what Pastor Suki shared you know, three weeks ago, right? when he, when he talked about a worship that transforms and about how human by nature are worshiping creatures. Because we can see that through history. Now, one thing, one interesting I want to share with you is what is the newest false gods that's uh, very in, you know, the last few years, the last few decades that gaining a lot of popularity, right? Um, a lot of us, when we think about idols or things to worship, right? You might just say, oh, maybe it's money, maybe it's power, it's comfort. But do you know that there is a, a rise of new gods? And again, I'm borrowing this from, uh, from a book, and they say it's actually the, you know, it's the self-worship, it's the self-glorifications, it's the self as the new gods. So in that study, um, the, the author Right, Kinnaman and, and Lyons, they do a lot of surveys among the Americans. And what they found is that 48% of Americans believe that enjoying yourself is the highest goal of life. And 86% believe that to enjoy yourself, you must pursue the things you desire most. And 91% affirm this statement, to find yourself, look within yourself. And if you follow this, this new popular uh, religion, right? Um, and this is from another um, article. Uh, it's called Self-Worship is the World's Fastest Growing Religions. And that's the new in. That's, um, 
that's what's been permeating in our society, in our cultures, in movies, in songs. And so if you're parents with young kids, you know, try to, to, when you watch a movie, try to see some of this uh, message within that movie because oftentimes, you know, I'm gonna share six messages, oftentimes one of them is gonna be there in the movie or in the songs or in just in, uh, in the media. Uh, so the first one is they say, your mind is the source and standard of truth. So no matter what, trust yourself. Hashtag, the answers are within. You are the summum bonum, the standard of goodness. So don't let anyone oppress you with the antiquated notions of being a sinner who needs grace. Hashtag, never change. And you are sovereign. So flex your omnipotence and bend the universe to your dreams and desire. Hashtag, live your truth. And the next three. You know, you can call this the six commencements of the self-worship religion if you want to. But again, this is the next three. They say, you are supreme. So always act according to your chief end. To glorify and enjoy yourself forever. Hashtag, YOLO. Your emotions are authoritative. So never questions. Or let anyone else question your feeling. They're always right. Hashtag, follow your hearts. And the last one, you are the creator. So use that limitless creative power to craft your identity and purpose. Hashtag authenticity. Again, these six messages, right? And I would call them the six commandments of the self-worship religions. But I, I really want you to, to really look and read again. Uh, because there are two, two things I want to share. One is... It's kind of everywhere in our culture these days, right? The answers are within, never change, live your truth, live authentically, follow your hearts, and YOLO. These are like everywhere in, in many media and songs and movies. And so I, I want to encourage you to look through the, the media that they consume through these filters and to see whether any of these hashtags, you know, associated or are part of that, uh, whatever media you consume. The next thing, though, that I do want to share is not all these six are bad in itself. So I want to be clear that, let's say, your emotions, right? Your emotions are not bad. God has emotions. God gives us emotions. It's a gift from God to, to have feelings, to feel emotions. And that's what brings people close, right? That's what brings family close. On the other hand, you know, when all these good things become your ultimate things, when they become the thing you worship, when you let them become the driver of your life, that's when you have fall away from Christianity. Again, to an idol is something that you put your meaning into, something that you believe will save you, something that you something that you use to decide your life, right? And all these things, although they are good, they're not supposed to be the ultimates. And let's speak, again, let's continue on. Like, why is that a problem? You know, even though they're good, that becomes a problem when they become the ultimate things. Again, the easiest thing for this is feeling. Because for me, <laughs> that's my daughter, um, what happens when you let your feelings become your authority, right? When you always follow your hearts. For me, that will mean I'll keep changing my decisions. It might also mean to leave my wife because for some of you who has been married for a long time, you know, the excitement, you know, if, if you are addicted to that feeling of excitement, meeting your girlfriend, you know, holding your, what, not, holding your uh, girlfriend's hand, right? There, there is that jolt of excitement. Right? And when you let feelings to drive your life, then sooner or later, you know, when the relationship settles in, when you become comfortable with one another, then you'll say, I lose that feeling. What is that feeling? Maybe she's not the, the one. Maybe I've been fooled all along. I need to find someone else to have that feeling back. Right? So feeling in itself, you know, as I said, it, it's changing from hour to hour, day to day. You know, I can feel good 
after I drink boba, you know, I feel energetic. You know, I'm drinking some coffee, drink some boba, then it will feel good. You, you, you try to fast and you feel bad. Be like, I'm hungry, I'm so angry. You know, I remember uh, yesterday, actually, my kid wake up early and woke me up. And I, he is complaining he's angry, hangry. And I'm, you know, still tired. And he woke me up. I, I'm, I'm hungry as well in the morning. And then he wake me up. It's like both of us are just, you know, being at war in the morning, right? Your feeling is affected by a lot of other things. And the same thing if you put your intellect as your ultimate, right? Your mind can fail you. What happened when you grow old? What happened when an accident happened and you lose, you know, your ability to think? Does that mean your life is over? And going back to that, you know, that, that guy, David Foster Wallace, right? I read to you just the first statement before, but if you're continuing, this is what he says. If you worship money and things, then you will never have enough, never feel you have enough. Again, the important thing is you feel you never have enough. Worship your own body and beauty and sexual allure, and you will always feel ugly. Worship power, and you will end up feeling weak and afraid, and you will need ever more of you will need ever more power over others to numb, to numb you to your own fear. Worship your intellect. Being seen as smart, you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. The compelling reasons for maybe choosing some sort of God to worship is pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. Pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. And what do you know, church? A few years later, after this speech, he killed himself. I, I never know, you know, we'll never know what's eating him alive to the point where he decided to end his life. But I think the fact that this guy, who's not even a Christian, can see that, hey, we are a creature of worship, is interesting. And to read through the implications of what we worship, it's like a sobering statement. Because right? this guy is the one at the, at the top of his professions. Again, he, he, he has money, he has power, he, he is acknowledged by a lot of people. I think the uh, LA Times call him influential, most influential writers in the past 20 years. Right? He all, he, to some degree, he has a lot of the things that people admire. And from his positions, he can say all these things. And at the end, to kill himself. So it's a sad story. But I hope that this brings you know, a sober news to all of us. While we all are here in the church, I do want to encourage us to look beyond our attendance, to look beyond the, sings, the song that we sing, and to look into our hearts, to, to find into your hearts what is the thing that's driving your life. What is it? Then when it's lost, you will lose your will to live. And while I go through, you know, the six commandments, you know, the answers are within, never change, live your truth, YOLO, follow your heart, authenticity, I do want to compare it with what the Bible is writing about our God, the one true God. And it's from Philippians 2, verses 5 to 9, and this is the message versions. Think of yourself the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantage of that status no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave, become human. And having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life, and then died a selfless, obedient death. And the worst kind of death at that, crucifixions. Because of that obedience, God lifted him high and honored him far beyond anyone or anything. And in there, I'm coming up with just some cool hashtag. Apologize if it's not as cool. I'm not an Instagram professional. Um, I do want to contrast you know, what we've just seen in that self-worship to what our God is saying to us, right? Instead of following your heart, following your emotions, or find your answer within, 
And oh, no, Jesus, show us that it's following our God. That is the way to live. You know, instead of finding success and splashy life, it's about being obedient, you know, living a selfless life, living a humble life. And church, it's, it's one thing to worship a God that is the creator, that's all-powerful, that's mighty. But it's a whole lot another thing to worship a God who despite his glory, who despite his power and wisdom and all that he has, willing to let go of it and come to the world to save us. Now going back to my beginning, right, the seasons of giving, I, I told you that the, the, the meaning of Christmas, you know, if you really accept the gift of Christmas, you'll need to swallow your pride. Right? Why? Because to accept the gift of Christmas, to accept Christ that come into this world, is to realize that we are beyond saving ourselves, that we are not self-sufficient, that we are not all that powerful. That Christmas means that we are so lost, so unable to save ourselves, that nothing less than the coming and the death of our God could save us. That means you're not somebody who can pull yourself together and live a moral and good life. You know, to accept the true Christmas gift, you have to admit that you are a sinner in needs of help, in needs of grace. To accept Jesus, you know, this baby, onto your hands, you know, into your embrace, to say, God, we welcome you. God, thank you that you've come, is to say to yourself, God, I cannot save myself. God, I'm not all that mighty and powerful. That God, I need your help. Oftentimes in our life, there's always that struggle. You know, a part of us, you know, part of our corrupted, sinful life that always wants to be the captain of our own soul, that always want to be on the driver's seat, that always want to sit at that altar, to be worshipped, to make our own decisions, to be glorified, to enjoy ourselves, to say to others, Look at me. I'm great. But for us, for you, you know, if you really want to welcome him, to accept him, and be glad that he has come, you know, that is the pride that you need to swallow. And that can be uh, harder than just getting the anger management book, right? Anger is one thing. And to say that you are beyond saving is a whole different thing to say that, God, I give my life to you because you know better. That requires such humility. But church, if you do accept, you know, if despite the, the prideful pain that you have to swallow, it is truly a joy to the world. Right? So, you know, we sing this song just now, joy to the world. It is truly the joy because our God is not a God that is just afar. He's not a God who created us and left us to our own demise. He's not a God who's judging us simply on our actions, but He's a God who extends His hand when we need help. He's a God who gives a warm comfort when we are alone. Because he himself has come and know what it means to be lowly, to be lonely, to be poor, to be persecuted, to go through injustice, to be hated, to be misunderstood. And yet he, he bore it all and died at the cross so that he can save us, so that he can be with us. You know, Emmanuel, God is with us. That is the joy, church. That is the joy this Christmas. You know, once you can go past, you know, that, that pride that you have, 
that you need help. But once you go past that, when you really accept Him, what a joy it is. What a joy it is. Because He is with us. You know, and He's coming not simply just to forgive us for our sins. You know, salvation does not consist in just in forgiveness and in knowledge, but salvation you know, consists in God making us His children and sharing His divine nature with us. You know, sharing His Holy Spirit with us. And that is the joy. You know, He has come not just to show us the way, but He has come to share His life with us and to bring us into His family. You know, an eternal life with God. That is the joy. That is the joy. And that's why John says, But to all who receive him, who believe in his name, he gave power to become children of God, God's sons and daughter, member of his family. And so if some of you, you know, feel lonely, if some of you feel far from a friends, we feel like, oh, what am I going to do this Christmas? I'm alone without anyone caring about me. And this is for you because God has come and he is with us. And the other thing is that as He makes us His children, that makes us, you and I, and all of us, as a new family, because we are all adopted by God. We are all sinners saved by grace. We are all brothers and sisters again and again. You know, Paul reminds us that as a church, we are brother and sister. We are a family. And that is, you know, I would say the bonus joy. Because not only I have God as my Father, but I have all of you as my new family. And I want to take this chance to also thank you for each of you has shared uh, your life with me and I guess with one another. And thank you for the wonderful friendship and to be part of this God's family. Amen. Let's close our eyes and pray. For our God in heaven, in this Christmas season, as we look to celebrate the coming of your son Lord first of all help us to repent help us to repent if we have worshipped other things help us to repent if we put other things on your besides you because Lord help us so there shall be no other gods in our hearts that you alone reign supreme in our life that you are our God, one and only Lord. And help us to see all the other things and help us, Lord, to put them in proper place. Because oftentimes, the other things that we worship are indeed a good things that's come from you. But because of our sin, we mistakenly them and we put them as our own God. But you alone, O oh Lord, are the one true God, worthy of worship, worthy of adorations. For you, the all-knowing, the all-powerful, has come into this world to be with us and to save us and to bring us home with you. What a joy, Lord. What a joy. May that joy remain in our hearts. May that joy bring happiness to the people around us. May others may see that joy, O oh Lord, and come to know you as well. May we be the beacon of light. You know, may our life and our joy and our smile and our enthusiasm be the thing that led people to you. Because you alone, O oh Lord, are worthy of worship. Amen. Uh, let's stand up and let's worship this last song.